Okay, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. You didn't seriously think this was gonna be yet another PowerPoint presentation. Hi, today I'll be talking to you about the comparative thoughts that exist between Western philosophy and African philosophy. This is an especially relevant theme to discuss in light of South Africa's recent student-led fallist protest movement or protest landscape. Hashtag roads must fall, hashtag fees must fall, hashtag data must fall. Okay, scratch that last one. One of the objectives of these fallist movements is to secure free decolonized education for South African students. And the debates around African philosophy tie in with this objective. Engaging with the writings of African scholars of philosophy, Kwasi Wiredu, Fidelis Okafor, and Edwin Eti Eyibo, I'll present my discussion with particular attention to my own area of research interest, which is education inequality in South Africa. We begin with Kwasi Wiredu, who comments on the existing debates in Western philosophy as to whether or not such a thing as African philosophy actually even exists. Native American African studies researcher Jennifer Lee Savest argues that to question the legitimacy of African philosophy is the same as asking if Africans actually even have the ability to be rational thinking beings. To put it more crudely, they're basically asking, are Africans even human? This kind of thinking is a result of coloniality or the colonial mentality which overvalues Western philosophy and devalues African philosophy, a byproduct of the race-based project of colonialism. Wiredu then goes on to ask the big question of what African philosophy is and what it should be, paying no credence whatsoever to the Western universalist claim that African philosophy doesn't exist. He theorizes conceptual decolonization as a precondition for good African philosophy, which involves the removal of colonial modes of thought so that we make use of the thoughts we adopt as a result of our own reflective choices as Africans. The second component and a key role player in the process of conceptual decolonization is language. According to Wiredu, if by virtue of a colonial history, an individual is trained right from the beginning in a foreign language and initiated thereby into the processing of philosophy, then certain basic ways of thought that are natural to native speakers of that language might become natural to the African event individual as well. This leads we ready to conclude that the solution to this problem is for African philosophers to think in their own vernacular languages. I am Venezuela. <laughs> The 1976 Soweto uprising is a good example of this, with Bantu education's racist language policy designed to keep black Africans in an inferior position to whites. Young black high school students fought for the right to be taught in a language that would allow them to engage critically with their curriculum. So although at that time the struggle was between English and Afrikaans, not wanting to be taught in Afrikaans and desiring to be taught in English, now the struggle is between any language that has been imported onto the African continent via colonialism and our indigenous African languages. Kwasi Wiredu then goes on to defend his position using the following reasoning. It is possible for people of different cultures to philosophize. Interaction across cultures will lead to greater familiarity with each other's languages and philosophies. The lie of who is racially superior to who will eventually evaporate, allowing for the cross-appropriation and the cross-fertilization of ideas, therefore making cultural difference irrelevant. In summary, the mandate of African philosophy is as follows, to reverse the superimposed Western intellectual categories on elements of African thought, as well as to reinforce the habit of conceptual self-examination, which is one of the cornerstones of philosophy in the first place. Eti Egibo illustrates this point in his critique of Thaddeus Metz's articulation of Ubuntu moral theory. He labels Metz as a Western universalist and describes his assessment of Ubuntu as culturally imperialistic because of how he measures African philosophy against Western ideals. To quote Eti Egibo, his interpretation of Metz reads as follows. In order for Ubuntu moral theory to be respectable and desirable, a plausible Ubuntu moral theory is to be aligned in such a way so as to fit with some superior paradigm of the West, namely the liberal paradigm. In other words, if it ain't white, then it ain't right. This is like comparing apples with bananas because liberalism and communitarianism upon which Ubuntu is based are two different paradigms. 
the former being Western and the latter being an African paradigm. And in seeking to integrate the two conflicting values in his theory, Metz undermines the communitarian status of Ubuntu in his theory. The third reading, titled African Philosophy in Comparison with Western Philosophy by Fidelis Okafor, starts off by reminding us exactly what is meant by the African in African philosophy. Some early African philosophers tended to liken themselves with Egypt because of its status in the West as the cradle of civilization. In terms of philosophy, Egypt is not that significantly linked with Black Sub-Saharan Africa, like Black Africa, Black Africa, like Africa, 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 Africa proper, dark skin, broad noses, and full voluminous lips kind of Africa. I'm allowed to say it because that's exactly what I look like. I know that's right! Okafor references the writings of Placide Franz Temples, Alexis Kagame, and John Mbiti, who were among the first thinkers of African philosophy. Franz Temples was a Belgian missionary who wrote and published Bantu Philosophy in 1943. He drew a dichotomy between Greek philosophy and African philosophy. He wrote about the methodology of Greek philosophy as one that was speculative, argumentative, logical, therefore leading them to a process of rational inquiry concerned mostly with the beginning of existence. Original African philosophy was premised upon the idea of philosophers or just critical thinkers in the community as having a duty to their communities. Africans reflected on their existence in relation to the universe and this mode of thought was embedded and expressed in the practices, rituals and belief systems of groups across sub-Saharan Africa. They were more concerned this is now the Africans, they were more concerned with the meaning of existence as opposed to the beginning of it. Temples draws a further dichotomy between the Western and the African definitions of being. Being is a static concept in Western philosophy, leading them to think of entities as merely beings. In African philosophy, however, the state of being is conceived of as dynamic, leading Africans to the view of entities as forces. Because Franz Temples was a white Belgian missionary, much of his work was dismissed by other African scholars of philosophy who felt that it was inappropriate for theories of African philosophy to be developed by a non-African. Alexis Kagame, another African philosopher, deductively observed that philosophy can be extrapolated from language, which we can link to the theory of Wiredu, who advocates strongly for indigenous language usage in the dissemination of African philosophy. Lastly, Okafor references John Mbiti, who writes about differences in the conception of time. Westerners having a rather linear idea of time, as opposed to Africans who conceived of an indefinite past, a dynamic present, and virtually no future. Okafor points out that the main points of dispute with African philosophy is that it is mostly oral and not much of it is written down, therefore imposing the problematic condition of philosophy only being adequate if it is in the form of readable material. Okafor also touches on the five major philosophical perspectives that can be found in African philosophy. These include ethnophilosophy, which is also thought of as folk philosophy, professional philosophy perspective, the Saudi Bohalan approach, which focuses on the spiritistic and superstitious elements of African philosophy, philosophical sagacity, and lastly, nationalist ideological perspective of philosophy. We end off with Kwasi Wiredu guiding us on how not to compare African traditional thoughts with Western thoughts. African thoughts is usually thought of as traditional thoughts, as it has been orally transferred. This kind of thoughts is the kind of thought that we are taught. What? This kind of thoughts is the kind of thought that we are taught not to try to rationalize considering the superstitious beliefs, practices, and rituals that go with it. We already warns, however, that rationality is not a preserve of the modern West, nor is superstition a peculiarity of the African peoples. Wiredu also gives comment on modernization and how it ought to be an all-round project. Although the West is technologically and economically sophisticated, their political, social, religious spheres are not as similarly developed. I assume Wiredu tells us this with the hope that Africans start to recognize where their own philosophies are far ahead of those that are lacking in Western philosophy. Hopefully we discontinue the act of trying to match up to philosophies that weren't designed in the context of Black African history. So all of these perspectives of African philosophy are very relevant to the research I intend to carry.
carry out over the issue of education inequality in South Africa. Gwazi Wiredu's discussion on the inclusion of indigenous languages in the quest to develop African philosophy is very much in line with calls for mother tongue education, not only in South Africa, but also globally. And this information is verifiable through UNICEF's Global Goals for Education. The longer indigenous languages are devalued in our institutions of learning, the more we passively promote the idea of academic excellence requiring configurations of whiteness in order to pass as adequate. So although South Africa has been a democracy for 27 years now, it is going to take far more than 27 years to undo centuries worth of cultural imperialist shandis. And so the question I want to leave you with is, apart from the African philosophies, the kinds of African philosophy that I have mentioned, what others do you know of or are you familiar with? Thank you for watching my seminar.